Welcome. This is a June 12th OpenZFS production user call. We have Santi, Daniel, Steve, Rod, Stu, myself, Michael, Jan, and Greg W. And we were just talking in the in the pregame show about replicating replicating a full pool, as in everything in that pool. And is can that or can that be done with a dash R with possibly a few more flags? I think Rod, you had the floor. Yeah, there's the it's on the send command, you will use a dash capital R and the pool name only. So it's a ZFS send, not Z pool send. Uh, oh, full Z pool. So Z pool. Uh, yeah. Uh, you need to add ZFS. Uh, yeah, I'm getting there. Yeah. Okay. I'm getting there. Uh, full pool name without a snapshot. No, you need a snapshot. You do. It's got to be the so, pool name. Yes. And you actually have to create a snapshot starting at the pool name. So recursive. You can, you can say DFS snapshot pool name at today. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, but seems, my seems like bigger we should... confusion point for most people that it, it confused me for a while. When I do a Z pool create foobar. There is the zpool foobar, and there is a data set foobar. If you look at a, a uh, ZFS list, you will see that you have this data set that matches the name of the pool. And it's a data set. It's not just the pool. It's actually, and that confuses some people. And that's that's the place that, that things like the um, the ZFS snapshot dash R pool name at foo will show up. They'll show up at that level. So there is actually a data set at the root of the pool. And often, the other thing that confuses people, often if, it's, if this is a BSD install created pool, that data set is marked no mount or auto mount equals no. So it never mounts. And so you don't really see it. And you don't know it exists. And you can get yourself into some trouble if if you're not aware of that. And then all of your data sets are descendants of that pool, or uh, of that data set, even. I, I don't know about, I'm sure you're, you're right on the BSD side. On the Illumina side, um, that root data set is mounted. Okay, that that can be changed. I'm just the the, the BSD install defaults to set it. To clarify, or, not on the root pool, but for other pools. So if you make a second pool, it will be thing. a mounted one. Same so. thing. Oh, that's the, that's what the BSD install does. BSD. Okay. Yeah, it's BSD install. It's what I'm talking about. Most people have a single pool situation that was set up by BSD install and they're just adding data sets to it. So they don't get off into these the, these scenarios where they're actually creating pools on other disks and and there's some things uh, to be aware about. I prefer to keep the operating system and bulk data separate on system wide. I have a lot of data. Yeah, I do. I'm the same way on everything. Uh, because it means that I can just move the bulk storage to another system Yep. It's hard to beat the uh, bandwidth of just plugging your JBot into a different controller. Never underestimate the bandwidth of a Volkswagen full of DATs. <laughs> yeah, that's the old fish man. But even that pales compared to plugging a 90 disk JBot into a different controller. I, we're just updating the idea, though. Yeah, and the distance yeah, but... and. If you if you want to really get yourself, I guess, understanding the two difference, the two commands to look at is do a Z pool get in the name of the pool. Um, you may you may have to say get all yeah, Z pool uh, Z pool space get space all space pool name. And that will show you the properties of the pool and then do a ZFS get all in the pool name. 
And that will show you the properties of the root data set that is at the, the same level as it's at the top level. It's the root data set. Yeah. Well, I just tried it and the operation was a complete success. Um, so just, ca oh, and I think the minimum that I needed was just capital R on the send side, obviously other goodies, and then capital F on the receive side. It, it cloned the entire pool uh, with no mercy yeah. you, uh, about what was there. Yeah, the capital F is no mercy. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Be yeah. warned about no. that. Oh no, my my entire the whole point of my utility is is do not add the no mercy flag. Uh unless you unless you well, I mean if you really want to, you can do whatever you want, but it's Unix. <laughs> so, um Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so that's I just I, I guess I just didn't uh I didn't conceptualize that because I'm thinking, oh it's a it's a data set, so how could its birth relate to the, you know, another another name top of a pool? Because that is slightly different than any other data set because it doesn't actually get, you know, zeroed out or removed. It it, you know, it replicates it magically somehow. I mean not magically, but you know, it 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 deals with that that condition of a, a pool and it, it is a little bit different than a data set, than a regular data set. Yeah, it's a data set. It's yeah. a data set yeah. like any other. It's just that it's required to be there by virtue of the pool having the same name. So I guess in my really... imagination, sorry, I guess in my imagination, I was I was thinking of it as as not as when you do a dash capital F that goes all the way back, that it's actually deleting the data set. But that's maybe that's not quite quite correct. Oh. Could you use um, maybe an extra parent um, or even just the root data set and then user properties to store the pool properties on the inside a data set on the target? Well, I think so the you next, have a little I script we... to go uh, over, oh, this source is a pool. Let's say the pool properties uh, embedded into user properties. Yeah, that's no, I mean, that's no. That's no problem. I guess the next sort of the next level of of sort of secure backups that I was thinking of is until ZFS user user space comes comes along, the you know, the solution would be to do that, you know, in a in a VM. So if you're backing up an untrusted pool, you'd want to do it in some compartmentalized space. So um so so yeah, and in that case you would do it. <clears throat> you would do it in a in a VM, and can you get the entire pool? And the answer that I guess should have been obvious to me that wasn't is yes, you can replicate the entire pool, and it 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 does it. So I just wasn't. I guess I guess the only part of confusion for me was that 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 top data set could could accept a you know dash dash r send dash capital F receive, and it absolutely does. I mean, there's and, you know, no problem. You can Am I unmuted? You're, You're you are yeah. unmuted. No. You can get you can get past the da the need for the dash f if you receive into a data set that does not exist in the receiving pool. Right, and then yeah, you don't I have mean, to use the dash s f option, and that right, data that's... set. That the, the, the data set that you receive into will receive all of the properties of the root data set from the pool that you're sending. Right. That's yeah, and that's what that's what Zelt is all about. Right. Is that a backup is a backup. It doesn't damage anything. It it creates what it needs to create, it rotates what it needs to rotate. And it shoves it down one level. Right. Uh, down a level, but will it honor a root mount point and give you a bad day no okay. um, it won't it'll tell you to go to hell okay. i mean you know again it's <laughs> unix so you can tell it you can always tell it to do yeah something can... that that is not my intention but yeah yeah i i think no, zelta it... zelta will tell you to go to hell because it does a dash x mount point right 
by default. Yeah, by by default. But if you um, so in the in the latest version, if you if you hand it well in in a development version, if you hand it any flags at all, it'll it'll take any 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 unambiguous sender receive flags. It'll uh, it'll replace its default flags with the ones that you specify. So you could just replace Zelta like the ZFS send receive command with the Zelta command with the same switches you use um in a in a single line and it'll 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 honor that and you know that's obviously the documentation is structured around don't do that do do it you know there's there's no there's no need to lose data or risk losing data in a backup job that's that's not what a backup job is that's not well in my opinion not what a backup job is uh, obviously zfs is more than just backups but um yeah but you can you can override anything in, in, you know, in the spirit of Unix lets you RM dash RF slash unless you're in Linux. <laughs> What'll it do on Linux? It'll say, don't do that, please. Really? No, you have to type, no. you have to type dash dash force, please. Oh. Thank you. Oh, God. I'm dash, uh, dash dash dash. I'm root right now. Please don't do that. Oh, goodness. This is like I I, VLC quite long ago decided that you can no longer run VLC as root in X. Same with Chromium. I'm like, oh, hey, yeah. That's my, yes. that's my freaking administrative policy, not your guys's to enforce. Hmm. Right. I, I have a jail. I have a jail that lives. And said that you really shouldn't run anything <laughs> using Qt uh, as root. <laughs> well, I, I, if I have a jail that lives for 15 minutes and has access to just a TTY and you know basic basic dev. I, I have no reason not to run my X terminal in, as root. You know, it's it's just sort of funny to and, me that like I have a perfectly secure jail environment. It's like don't do that. You could root something. You're root. That's yeah, my potentially you have even disabled super user in the jail, so your ID zero is no longer privileged. Of course, right. just comparing the EUID to zero won't catch that. But uh, just joking, if you really want to perfectly back up a pool, put uh, ZFS on v uh, Z volts and replicate the Z volts. There you go. Yeah, right. Which, of course, it's not really serious but uh, potentially you could just use zfs as a volume manager and then replicate the block volumes if you really needed to do that and you in know, a if hypervisor it's... that may actually make sense that you do the replication on the zfs and the host and then run zfs and a guest to yeah i mean it's always it's always theoretically possible like if i was to provide a backup service of some kind that somebody could, who is really diligent and really skilled, could write a little time bomb in their in their send job that would that would do some damage. So it, it's just, you know, something like that has to has to exist for yeah. CFS to be the absolute perfect backup. There needs to be some some protection. But I I mean I guess there there already are well, like actually, a half a dozen ways to do that. For your perfect backups, you need diverse implementations. You don't want a monoculture where a single source code bug could wipe out everything. Right. You right. would want right. to archive in a different format, even if it's lossy because that's an under, well understood loss instead of uh, potential everything is perfect until it isn't. Okay, that's pretty hypothetical. I love it, but let's get practical. I would love to say... Well, Go ahead, Andrew. One one quick thing. Yeah, um, I double checked, and actually, we do mount the R pool, so I don't mess with the R pool as much. But yeah, it's it, it's mounted as R pool on my machines, so which is the pool name as well. Cool. Uh, one quick follow up from last week: there was some confusion over using. ZDB without a zpool.cache file. And I found that using dash E, even though the pool is not exported, worked quite well, such that 
I must wonder if that's a documentation question, not a implementation question. So people are doing the nifty, see how big your files are. You can scroll down for that. But I just want to bring that up based on the conversation left. I can anyone I else let this one to completion? Uh, I believe so. Go ahead, Rodney. I could not get the dash E to work for me. I literally had to create no a DFS.cache file. Okay, interesting. I had to use Jan's trick of, of creating a ZVOL and then creating a new ZFS pool on it and then destroying it. And that gave me a ZFS cache and then ZDB worked fine. You no, don't even kidding. need a okay. ZVOL, you can use a file. Just yeah. truncate it uh, to yeah. one gig uh, and then it's easier to dispose of than having to destroy the MD device, but of, of ZVOL, but it works. Yeah, just any, anything to create a, a visible pool of the machine and cause it to write a cache file, which tells me my install procedures and installer and stuff create a system that does not have a ZFS cache. I went and looked at all my machines. I don't have ZFS cache anywhere. Mm -hmm. How Ooh. ancient are your boot blocks? I am rolling my own installer. Hmm. The boot blocks match exactly to what the operating system is that is running. Hmm. So it's in service. Is is it the ZFS ZFS enable um, in in FreeBSD? I thought that's what wrote the that did the mounting and wrote the cache. It can't write to a cache file if on the pool oh, because right. it's not it's read only at the point that it loads that module. It doesn't have a read write Got it. pool, so it can't do it. And that's that's what creates the problem because I create, I create and populate the pool through other mechanisms that are not the booted pool. They're not so. Etsy ZFS is not a, the the place that the ZFS cache gets written to is the Etsy ZFS directory of my installer, yep. not of the actual pool that ends up being booted. Do you boot through your install media every time? No. Again, it, the point it tries to write that cache file, the pool is in a read-only state. Hmm. Uh, because I had this problem when I used uh, to have an unencrypted slash boot and then basically SSH'd in and rerouted and so on. That, yeah. Other questions? Santi, Steve, Greg, Stu. We can't totally uh, geek out on no. previous year on you. Go ahead. Uh, no, nothing. Enjoying the uh, the back and forth. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, it might be kind of inside baseball that's OS specific. Go ahead, Greg. Sorry, I was just saying I have to jump off. There's, I have an early meeting today. So. Hey, no worries. Sure. Take care. Yeah, you too, guys. Have a good one. Uh, have a good one. Happy Father's Day, too, this weekend. Ah, yes. That, too. Speaking Ooh. of uh, of uh, you know uh, root data sets, you know there's there's one happy happy Father's Day. It's topical. <laughs> ah, yes. Aha. <laughs> Ooh, I have some news. So some of you may know I was chasing some FreeBSD fourteen point oh and fourteen point one release bugs that were were related to MakeFS dash T ZFS, which allows an unprivileged user to spit out a Z pool for an install image, et cetera, boot image. And uh, that will now, and from what I can tell successfully, mirror hardware devices created from that. So you create a VM image, drop it on a physical image, boot to it, do some acrobatics to move that over to another image, including a Z, ZFS send, actually no, a no, a rebuild uh, and attach as a mirrored device, which was panicking and now it's fixed. And I've done it under 15 current and 14.1. So I'm a happy camper. I've wanted that simplicity for a long time and it hopefully ensures I never see an installer again. Uh, you boot your image, you Z pool, um, attach, attach, and then detach. I boot it. I have a second device of the same size. I dump over the partition table. I relabel it so it's like if I partition one or two sure. up a number, then DD for what it's worth, DD over the just 
earliest blocks in the EFI partition and boot partition, just so that, hey, they should be the same, I'm guessing. Then I attach the data partition and it's happy to even to a point that I, I think I removed the original and could boot off the mirror. Yeah. The question is, do you want a unlabeled mirror for the EFI boot partition? Uh, by default, the file they seem to be labeled. No, no, as in G mirror without a label. Oh, ew. Um, so that so if you mount it and change your EFI partition, the changes are actually a mirror to both disks. That is an age old question. And the whole fact that it's FAT32 for EFI things, not that I uh, think of ZFS any, anytime soon. I think still. on some systems you can do it NTFS if you like. Oh, really? No, no, kidding. Okay. no. Huh? no. no? Okay. No, the EFI standard clearly states what supported file systems. Oh, yeah. There are some BIOSes that might grok an NTFS EFI, but it is not part of the standard. No, it's not part of the standard. It's to be FAT32 and FAT32 only. A choice of one? Well, nothing's nothing's not to standard on the internet. Well, yeah, but... <laughs> or in hardware. Does a spec di dictate only the one format? Um, yeah, I yeah. think FAT16 may be permitted. So. Maybe so. Yes, yeah, right. you can have a FAT16, but that was only because of the very early. Yeah, you, okay. Um, uh, because it makes sense on very small file systems. Yes. Cool. But these days you have so much bloat in there that it makes sense to format from FAT42. Mm -hmm. uh, Stu, do you have any multi-actuator news? multi-actuator drive news. Other than my cloning system isn't working to clone myself so I can actually have time to ah, do all that, yeah. All the fun stuff while my job gets in the way, which is why I had to drop off the first part of the call. So mm. not been ready then. Um uh my some minor testing but nothing nothing significant or telling at this point. Cool. Let's see Steve, do you have anything to report? Uh, I think just listening this nope. week. Dokey. If it makes you feel any better, I've already taken two phone calls during this meeting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so I just went and double My checked. condolences. I just went and double checked. E U UEFI specifies it must be FAT32. I ah, believe okay. it was before you in UEFI, the original EFI spec allowed or some BIOSes would actually boot from a 16-bit. Um, no, now I'm finding contradictions to that. If I remember EFI correctly. mandates support for FAT12, FAT16, and FAT32 at version 2.10. Hmm. There was FAT12? Yeah. Yep. Goodness. Yeah, FAT12 okay. was floppy. Yes, there was. Oh, goodness. Well, okay. FAT was floppy. Oh. You learn something every day. It might not be useful, but you learn it nonetheless. That was when you had to flip the floppy over to get double density. Uphill both ways in a snowstorm. Uh, so, other topics. So, I, I do have a... Please. Yeah. Um, so I have used uh, the ZFS uh, native encryption like a little bit, pretty lightly. Um, and there, there is a requirement from our corporate uh, IT that we have basically on our laptops uh, that we have sort of encryption at rest. Um. I guess I've been a little scared to do that. I'm wondering if anybody else is, I don't know, any recommendations or comments. I, I was, I've been thinking maybe what I'll do is boot into the OS and then mount the encrypted pull or something. Uh, I, you took oh, the words wait. out of my mouth. I have been using it on Mac OS for some time, and I am a very, very strong advocate of having just a 
a nested encryption route. I think that's the term. It's its own sort of parent data set, and then bring it in, bringing it in on demand. The whole notion of the OS being like fully encrypted and requiring a key at boot just uh, yeah makes me nervous because I um, want to know what the state of my pool is. Go ahead, Jan. So my question would be, what is the threat model you have to defend against? Is this about being able to arm a disk? About someone gaining physical access to a powered down system, uh, to a running system, and you have to detect an intrusion and <laughs> destroy the key material? Uh, what's well, your threat I, model? I, I'm not sure, Jan, because um, it's I would be making assumptions about whether our IT, you know, corporate IT is, you know, thinking clearly. Because about things. I, I think what it is, is is they're worried about someone stealing the laptop or we, you know, losing okay. the backpack or something like that. A laptop is one thing that makes sense. You know, the most annoying thing about full disk encryption on a company laptops is that you need the damn user to power it on and you can't reboot them remotely. Uh, it would be so tempting to have the user run everything instead of a hypervisor. <laughs> isn't, isn't the solution but, here just to use the hardware drive encryption and do it with a BIOS unlock? Yeah, SED, self-encrypting drive. Yeah, that's also a nice foot gun. Of course. If you ever have hardware damage and so on, uh, basically you find out that, oh, I moved the disk over, yeah, but uh, the key, you didn't move the TPM over. I tried to move the TPM over, but it was a firmware TPM and the real TPM chip wasn't even used. Yep. This kind of horror stories can be uh, entertaining to read about uh, on Halloween, but otherwise okay. you don't want to. But if you, for example, only have to be able to uh, Make sure that you can actually uh, send back crap to your vendor. Then maybe it's good enough to have two USB sticks uh, inside your chassis uh, on a server with the decryption keys on it. And you can have someone swap a drive, call for remote hands, and still have data address encryption uh, according to your checkbox uh, on your list. Uh, and if your threat model is just, I have to be able to send in parts and get a warranty replacement on them because that's our service model, then that's good enough. And you can just write off the, the cheap little disk or module or whatever you want to call it right. uh, with the key if it dies. And you have a backup of that. And with Jelly, for example, you can have... Two nope. keys with That's OS specific. keys, you yep. can nope. read from a file or and have a backup of that, or you can have a script which outputs the key material. Uh, Basically, what it comes down to, Steve, what mark, what industry are you in? Are you in finance, uh, or media entertainment, or healthcare? Yeah, like software, SM. Um, Small, medium-sized business uh, software as a service. Okay, so from an auditing standpoint, I'm not. I'm not... That's what I was going to get to. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So compliance. Yeah. Yeah. This, yeah. This is this is not legal advice. This is reality. Don't sue me. But as Jan was going through, the risk model is based upon what you're trying to protect. If you're trying to protect your emails. Don't keep them on your on your laptop. You know that those are the the type of mitigating controls that can alleviate having or being forced down to an encrypting a laptop. If your IT department is saying, "Hey, look, I saw the next greatest thing," air quotes that, "Hey, we need to do X," so we are checking a box on an audit form six months down the road, different conversation versus I'm trying to protect a million dollar file if it gets out in the wild. Haven't you heard the latest about uh, AI powered boot attestation with zero trust enabled? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Here's, <laughs> here's another thing to consider. Andrew, you had some, yeah. There is a very strong likelihood that your IT department 
doesn't even know what the threat model is. A lot of times right. where this stuff is coming from really isn't the IT department. A lot of times it's coming from your insurance provider. Mm -hmm. right. I know they in our business, we're seeing that. One at a time. So I, I know that, that, that I see that, you know, from my side of things where our, our insurance wants this. So then we have to somehow convince an insurance person, please tell us what we're doing with this tell us what the threat model that you're trying to repair against is. And of course, the person we're talking to at the insurance company has no idea. Either. Is, a, is a checkbox checker. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. And that's, Take those ticky boxes. Yeah. I mean, and we can go on for days and I've been to many conferences on information security, auditing, compliance, all that kind of crap. And you want to talk eyes glaze over really quick? <laughs> Well, um, how about reality? How about if we, how about if we just go with like what would make Steve comfortable? Like, <laughs> if if I lose my laptop or it's stolen at a coffee shop, and maybe it was even turned on, I don't know. Um, what I would like to sort of not have to do is is say, oh yes, the entire thing was just wide open. Um, I would actually like to just sort of protect my professional reputation in that moment um, and be able to say, actually, I was doing a few things pretty well um, and, and our well, risk should be lowered. Jan, hold what, tight. What, Let him finish. And what, my, and what Michael outlined is my, would be my approach as well. Is I, see. I, I have an encrypted portion where I keep my call it downloads or whatever, my application suites, stuff that mm -hmm. I really care about that I have to enter a key for it to mount. Whether it's a physical key, a, a biometric key, or just a known pass, pass phrase. That is... That sounds like the... Yeah, that, that, that sounds like the best trade-off. So, yeah, uh, the best not balance for joking. manageability. I've yes, seen uh, on uh, someone working in a quite sensitive field that they had a policy for their uh, operators to have a smart card on a um, keychain to your personal smartphone so they took it to the toilet with them. I've seen that. That's mm -hmm. um, certainly not unheard of. It's a bit clunky and it's funny to watch, but it makes sure that the system locks as soon yeah. as a person walks away. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is that like right. NFC? Um, Something where it's physically unplugged the USB. If you are willing to spend the money, you can get a, a light version of that with an Apple Watch. If it's not close by, the system locks. Of course, in theory, you can have an analog radio bridge to fake the proximity uh, by Bluetooth, but <laughs> what's your threat model again? Are you trying yeah. to... It's, it's not the, that. the NSA yeah. or um, your insurance uh, auditors. Yeah, I have a key system on an SDR so that I can trigger my ham, what ham toggle to open up my laptop. It's going really yeah. Old. <laughs> so do do you need a big capacitor to uh, physically? Uh, Erase your CPU if something goes wrong or not. Uh, Daniel, do you fancy <laughs> New Yorkers have some guidelines for young, them, them Wall Street folks? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I handle the. I mean, I basically do have done every combination of the things that everybody, everybody is talking about. But you know, I mean, I think I think encrypted home directory makes sense for you know, uh, for manageability, so you don't get the machine locked, because that's just dreadful. And then you deal with other you deal with other policies, like, you know, force locking in a short period of time and stuff like that, good password strength, etc. So they'll have to reboot it. And if they reboot it, then it's as you know, as the original question was encrypted on rest. I mean, that's the box that needs to be checked, right? So that mm -hmm. that solves that. And if I want to take it a step further, then I just I just make people use remote desktops and record those. So use VMs. That's one of the things Jan said. Use a VM. The VM is encrypted on REST. You have to VM in to use 
the 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 specific assets of the companies or the company's uh, stakeholders that uh, that are that are actually secured. And there's no, I mean, you know, then then I mean, you could still have somebody like record the person working or something like that, and then you're going to get data leaks. But it's <laughs> that's as good as it gets. Did you say Windows Recall? <laughs> when when is recall is allowed on the, as a service? <laughs> hey, we're getting chat GPT on Apple too. So that's gonna phone yeah. home. There's no way around it. Speaking of ZFS, Don't pay. <laughs> along these lines, I was wondering if instead of any password manager, a an encrypted data set could be sent to pretty much every system, including Windows ones, and it's just one little small place with that, and the decryption key gets handed out on a need-to-know basis, but... Uh, I wonder is a good way to, short of a hypervisor, uh, the system gets uh, locked to hold, basically take out the encryption keys when the system locks and basically pause it until it gets decrypted again, so that once you lock the screen, the laptop is really at rest. Does anyone know the way to come close to that with reasonable uh, sleep and wake up times? So shorter than a full reboot and preserving the memory yes. content of applications? Um, good question. In theory, there's encrypted suspend to disk, but yeah, good luck getting that working. Uh, are there official encrypted suspend to disks in, say, Windows, or just broadly, or what? Just you mean for sleep, or what? Yeah, what I guess this, um, this mythical everything is encrypted while sleeping, and it comes back to life and presumably needs a password on wake up, etc. I don't know, but we're little off topic from ZFS. Um, Presumably, if you're running yes. one of the said disks, then when it went to sleep, I would expect it to um, block the TPM and you would have to re-enter that. I could be wrong. Depends on how deep it went to sleep. Well, and said is at the disk level, not the TPM level. It, it has no idea. But what, I think like, but I think the TPM provides the key. The, the TPM usually provides the key to unlock the disk. If the TPM provides the key of an I square C bus without a password. It's not really a hardware encryption module. It's more like a plain text password storage. You just have to toggle the reset pin and read out the I square C bus. If you consider something like an easily made attack in a hotel. So if it auto decrypts on resume, then it's not secure by definition. Well, yeah, so, but I'm saying it shouldn't auto decrypt on, on resume. It should still have the TBM locked out and you should have to re unlock it before it can happily decrypt things again. Jason, welcome. Uh, show of hands, well, you just ZFS encryption? Um, did the meeting, the I, thought, I thought the meeting started at, at um, 20, 100 UTC. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, Dan good. was here mm -hmm. hours ago. Um, sorry, but you're doing just fine. Welcome. Uh, Hi. Uh, you had a question on the Fediverse, did you not? And you're going to make me do video, aren't you? Oh, no, Run you your is my answer. Uh, let's see. What were you asking, young man? You were thinking... Uh, ba, 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 ba. Oh, replication over the LAN, 10 gig. It might be due for a refresher because, uh, Daniel, I'm sure you have some opinions on that. But yeah, Jason Tubner, what, what you got? Um, how often are you doing it? What's your pipe? It sounds like it's several uh, kilometers, I, I, but it's... I, I think there's other really issues. Weird. I've got... Yeah, SSH is dumping its guts as well um, when it's to, when using Syncoid um, between, between hosts. So I don't know what's going on there. I just noticed all my data sets were all out of whack and I had to, I've had to manually intervene. But um, I'm just trying to work out how to make Broom Broom go faster because SSH is pinning out on a, on a, on a core 
which means it's not going to go any faster. So the the three and a half gigabits a second I'm seeing between hosts is basically going to be tops. Have you tried Zelta? What's that? Have you tried Zelta, the one that Daniel's been working on? So um, the problem is that some of the optimizations for multi coins on even from the HDN patches have been removed with the argument that AS and I and GCM with careless multiply instructions is fast enough. Correct. Um, so you need a, a different transport if you want to get faster than SSH on a single core. Um, yeah, I'm on a private network, so it's 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 a private network between it's so 20, 20 gig total between the two data centers, which are thirty k away from each other. What you can do on at least is you can use IPsec transport mode with a policy on the socket because in FreeBSD, IPsec policies can be scoped to globally an interface or even a single socket. So, and then you can use Netcat and INAD or something like that, or your own little wrapper and have the kernel's IPsec implementation do it, and if you put a policy on the socket as part of your tooling, um, the advantage is that you don't have to worry about not having the policy loaded because the application sets it up itself, or a wrapper it goes through, and um, you get good throughput, at least better than SSH. I think if Syncoid's uh, choking, it's gonna, it's it then netcat definitely will. Yeah. Okay. It's not. I mean, I I haven't had I I've I've had stability issues when I tried to squeeze every every bit of juice. You're are, are you you're not recompressing, right? You're just no, it's literally it's just the cores. It's, that it's is doing crazy. Raw, raw, so you're, <laughs> so you're, you're, Can you be wow. more precise about what puking and choking means for you? Those aren't really technical. <laughs> yes. Okay, okay. About. It's CPU limit, right? It's CPU limit. That's that's yeah. what you mentioned in the yeah. That's crazy. So, um, it, because I've seen other issues where the problem was at least for for offset replication was a bandwidth delay product, which Rod has discussed um, here multiple times on how to compute that, or just the problem that you didn't have enough buffer space and basically you were ping ponging, sending one hundred twenty eight kilobyte block out reading it, transferring it back and forth, and you just needed a few dozen to a few hundred megabytes of ring buffer on either side to allow both sides to find a steady state. Yeah, I'm using one gigabyte, one gigabyte of M buffer, so that's not an issue either. Well, M buffer is, uh, has, I think, officially been evicted from the ports uh, tree. Because uh, the original yeah. buffer has seen updates in the 90s. And it's I don't still, think M, M, buffer, M buffer can't override what the parameters of the kernel are for max shock buffer. You can't. No. Nothing you can do. It can't, but on site finish, yeah. on the same switch. Uh, so, Rod, anything else? And uh, uh, Jason, what's your ping time between those two hosts, if I may? Uh, under under a millisecond, under a millisecond. Okay. Yeah, Rod. What about your what about your magic sockets? That I Maybe posted it in the to... chat. That's oh yeah. That, that'll yeah. That just that eliminates the trip in and out of user land, but that also doesn't give him SSH encryption. And I'm going to. I don't, is this inside? Of, I, don't need, this inside? I don't. It's 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 dark fiber. I don't need any encryption. It's so it's all inside yeah, of so... the single data center. Yeah. So, so yeah, you're not you're not hitting BDP limits in either because the the default parameters are are adequate for ten gigabit on in a data center environment sub millisecond. Are you seeing gigabit. any frame drops on your switch? Maybe because there's a contested port somewhere in your fabric. We did we did have we did have it, but we've um, the, the firmware has fixed that. We were seeing that in our logs. 
because um, an occasional frame drop will also uh, kill your performance. Yeah, it was killing the performance. We were losing, we were losing probably a gigabit per second. Hmm. Can you can you turn ECN on RFC thirty one sixty eight in your switching hardware and and turn it on on the FreeBSD boxes and find out if you're getting um, what are called congestion experience marks, CE marks? Yeah, okay, I'll give that a go. Yeah, beware if you mess with flow control because that can be. EC, uh, ECN's turned, e, e, I know ECN's ECN's turned, is that separate from that. E, ECN's turned on on the host. It's I just don't think it's turned on on the switch. You have to. Well, the, the, have you turned? Have you changed the setting to two or one? I got to think about it. Have you changed it to one? Because the default, the default is turned on but only on one side. So it, it doesn't really get established. You have to set them both to, uh, is this BSD to BSD? Yes. Um, you need to set them both to, uh, ECN, tcp.ecn.enable equal one. The, the default is two, right? Yeah, the default is two, which means that the, the client will attempt it, but if the server doesn't accept it, it won't you won't get ECN. So uh, what a is that a bit mass? So should you set it to one or two free? What's this e, why is ECN max free tries? Who's oh uh, oh sorry, that's I just from the got chat. So CDL thought... for okay, uh, sorry. I don't understand why you're So what's a desired, Rodney, desired sys control? Um, Just let me get my laptop and I can tell you. Oh, there you it's, go. It, yeah, it, um, net.inet.tcp.ecn.enable. Oh, the second one, okay. Yeah, you don't want to tweak the max tries. Just leave that. Two seconds, I will delete it. I will delete it. On. See the de the default of that ECN is two, which says that if I'm the client, I will attempt I will ask the other end to do ECN. And if I'm the server, when I get that request and I'm set to two, I'll go, no, I don't do ECN. And so we don't actually end up getting very much ECN turned on anywhere. And remind our listeners what ECN stands for. Explicit congestion notification. And basically it's what it is, is if your hardware, if your switching hardware supports it, it can send a CE bit that says, I would have dropped this packet if you hadn't have been using an ECN. And that basically it tells you that you're you're congesting your switch or router. Routers can do it too. I wouldn't well, have dropped it. Or would have. It basically, it's a warning that it, your literally, is I would too have, long. I would have dropped it if you were not using ECM. Okay, thank you. The last bit of the queue capacity on a port or routing engine is reserved for traffic with ECM support. So let's say your queue is more than seven eighths full, then you get this. Mm. But you're not getting drop packets yet. So you have a gray zone in which to tune your congestion control without ever really having to drop a packet to get a signal that you are exhausting the, the link bandwidth. The other thing that you could be experiencing, Jason, is the brick wall problem in that you're probably... Whose 10 gig NIC are you using? Uh, it's a FS. Who? FS.com. Fiber store? Yeah. The uh, Nick they have Nicks. Nick? They oh, sorry, Nicks, not Nicks. Not oh, I thought you were talking about um, SFP plus no. connectors. Um, the Nick, I mean, it's an Intel Nick. Okay, like an X540 or something. Okay. Yeah, it's in a Lenovo uh, SR650. Okay. It is what, with full, full offload support going on and stuff, if you when you drop a big chunk of data on an offloaded NIC card, 
it can blast packets out so fast at 10 gigabit, it will literally overflow the 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 buffers in the switch. The switch can't keep up. The um, it's it's not having an issue with iperf. So iperf can max out the 10 gig link. In a single thread? Yeah, in a single thread. And you can okay, so you can you can iperf across this transport at full bore without yep. any loss. And yep. what does the what does the size of the congestion window grow to? Uh I haven't measured it because I never need to because I've like maxed it's, the link out. So it's I, like I per three I per three reports this the congestion window by default in the output. Okay. You no longer have to My, provide I'm, that V. I can so that's by default, you. Rodney? Yeah, I think so. Go. Cool. Thought you had to set dash V. Maybe only on one side by default, but no, no. you just just running iperf three on the client side, it will report I report the congestion window size. What it thinks is the congestion window size. It's not always correct. Okay, I'm running. Yeah, I'm seeing 9.25 gigabit per second between the data centers with no retries. Okay, good. Um, CPU utilization, 1.7%, user, 41% system. Um, everything looks fine there. It doesn't show you a column called CWND. Uh, yep, 1.60 megabytes. Oh, you're pushing right at the limit. Two max is the default. Uh, the D the, the, the CWND. The default is seven eighths of two megabytes, which is I I remember right. It's 1.6. So you're barking right at the congestion window limit. Yeah, but I'm hitting so, I'm hitting the exact bit rate for the link. So that means you don't have any time in your latency budget uh, of your bandwidth delay product for encryption. So it could actually be that just the time lost in encryption bites proportionally into your bandwidth because you're just at the window. And and that's, so that bump it to I'm, 16 max and try again. That means I'm like I'm doing... I've got six gig of overhead space. I'm not using. But you're basically yeah, but you're, you're you're literally your congestion window is coming into play and in, in going to bandwidth limit you. In other so words, if you add encryption, hold on. And use one, at time, one at a time. One at a time. Jan, give us a sec. Let we've got latency oh. to to uh, Jason Rodney. You were saying um, the. The scenario that you get into is you bump up against the congestion window limit is if do you have a capacity beyond 9.2 gigabits? I guess it wouldn't really matter if you can. The My is concern limited is to... if there is any additional latency at all on this link, your performance is going to freaking tank. Okay, the latency on the link is 0 0.398 milliseconds. Yeah, but see. Jason. So if it goes to 598 milliseconds, which is a very small increase, if it just goes up 200 microseconds, your bandwidth is going to tank. So what can happen, can be your problem is that you're not even running at the limit of SSH or single threaded throughput, but just you're filling up a pipe buffer of a few megabytes, if you have the memory for it, then context switching into SSH, it gets scheduled, it drains the buffer, it processes the buffer, and then writes the encrypted packets to the uh, socket. And because you're probably, uh, yeah, then do at a few a fraction of a millisecond to your latency, uh, you added increase the latency of the full path. So, um, your bandwidth delay product means you have less bandwidth because your latency increased. At least that's what I would assume. 
just try to bump your socket uh, buffer size to 60 megabytes and try again. No, 16 is it way changes. too big. He just, he just needs to double it. I just wanted to make sure 16 max won't hurt a system uh, which can push several gigabits a second. What's the what's the CTL for that? I'm getting it. <laughs> Always, yeah. I got to log into my router. So, <laughs> um, I don't have a window on it. It's kern dot ipc dot max sock buff. Yeah, there. Jan's got them. Cool. Yeah, those three. Tweak those three, and the 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 defaults are like two and four. Mine is set to two and two at the moment. All of them are two megabytes. Yeah, that's a default. Put them all to eight megabytes. And Rod, that Which was pushes primarily on the receiving max. system. You walked on each other. Yep. Uh, Rod, that's primarily on the receiving system, as I recall. No, both ends. Well, both I, ends. Uh, yeah, set those parameters on both ends. Got it. It can be that it's a no op in this case, but just please hurt anything. rule this out. <laughs> yeah. Depending on which way more data is flowing depends on which ends need whether send buff max or receive buff max, it increases. And, but both ends need max sock buffer increase. But unless your systems have lots of high latency connections and little memory, it doesn't hurt to bump those numbers. Yeah, we're actually we're actually looking at shoving the defaults up in the previous D15. Thank you. If 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 I could get some e e e, e spare time cycles to finish mm -hmm. the the write up work, I could get approval from the TCP working group to shove them to numbers as big as sixteen to thirty two megabytes. We're throwing out, but. So I'll try those three. Uh, let me see what the ECN setting is while we're here. Yeah. Uh, ECN enabled equals two. Yeah, set it to one. You're not getting it turned on. It needs to be set to one on both ends. And you're using an fs.com switch? Yep. Ten gig three. What's that? Do you know? Do you know which model, Jason? Uh yeah. Hang on. No, top of my head, but yeah. the internet's fast. Like fifty-eight fifty or an eighty-four sixty or something. It's got more than it's four hundred gig data center switch. Okay. Uh and. 5860. 48 SC. Got it. The rod, would it make sense to, uh, Auto tune the socket buffer size by the ratio of physical memory to current.ipc.max sockets or something like that? Yeah. 
we could play some games with trying to tune the size of this thing, but I really think that basically if we if we take it uh, where's my tubby? If we take it to 16 megabytes, um I don't have my data in front of me. I'm uh it, it, we that gives us the ability to 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 do um gigabit at almost trans Atlantic, transoceanic type connections. And so, so for that, anyone who needs more in the 15.0 or 15.x time frame, just mention it in tuning. Well, it, it, the, yeah, there's just the people that are going to need to increase it much more than 16 megabytes just don't exist. I mean, the need there is, first off, you don't need anywhere near that in these high-speed data center environments where you're at 10 gig and 100 gig because you're at very short latencies. The only place this no, comes was... into, in, Let him finish. In, into play is if you are transoceanic and moving lots of large data on fast connections. Now, if I had a 10 gig connection and was trying to move data between the United States and Europe, I would probably need to be running 64 megabyte buffers. So, so the uh, extreme example I was thinking of was a research network connection between Europe and Japan, for example, where you still expect over 200 milliseconds and tens of gigabits potentially. Yeah, but two, two and a half milliseconds, is, that's just not a problem. No, no, 200. Uh, nobody so should be experiencing... If you are going halfway around the continent... I'm doing that. We're, we're 160 between... San Diego and Australia. So, yeah, I was. I remember that back in the day it was I, I, I've almost done, 200 I, between Europe okay, but, and uh, Japanese practice, universities. Uh, mm, practice, not theory. In in real world experience, it, it, if you're seeing greater than 200 milliseconds, there's something really wrong with the network you're using. No, yes. physics. Which is like we we the speed of light can't get to the USA from Australia any faster than 170 milliseconds. Yep, yeah, but in that case, we got done doing it. I was in Brisbane for a week, and we were but, sending data all around the world from Brisbane. And basically, it's hard to get if if you're using reasonable networks, it's hard to get more than 170 to 180 milliseconds of latency going anywhere. So the well, for me to get to, say, about, New York or Toronto, it's over 200. So the link I was thinking about was a fiber connection going from Germany through the uh, British Channel, down past Africa, underneath uh, India, and then to Japan on rented fibers. Lots of bandwidth, but indirect routing. Uh, yeah, yeah was... you're using a poorly peered network. Yeah, it was for bike transport, and it was cheaper to do it that way. Okay, let's talk about I'm Jason's not, network. What, yeah, I'm Jason, not, I'm not worried about fixing the, the poorly peered networks in the internet. I'm worried about the bandwidth on properly engineered networks and, and the impact that this has on people using properly engineered networks. But, um, yeah, I, I, I perf run would be of interest, Jason, once you turn ECN on, on both ends, and you can run your your ZFS test to see what it does. Yeah, I've just done all those SysCTLs now. I'm just about to do an IPERF run. Okay, is everyone sitting down? It's a nail biter. I'm seeing... Yeah. I'm seeing about the same speed, so 9.3 gigabytes a second, but I've got the CWND at 5.42 megabytes. Ah, that's interesting. Can you is, please repeat that? Is it giving you a delay estimate? I think you have to do dash V to get the delay. I did the dash, dash capital V. Um, Oh, looking for the delay, I can't see. Okay. Is 
The congestion class is cubic. Yeah, that's fine. Cubic's good. Oh, wait a minute. What version of BSD are you on? 14.1. Both sets? Why did you set it yeah. to cubic? Uh, that's the that's regular that's standard um configuration. Cubic is a new default. One at a time. You cubic what? Uh, cubic instead of new Reno, it's the new default ah. uh, congestion control algorithm. I think it changed in 14.1, but it could have yeah, been 14.0. Right. I'm looking at my 14.1. The default is now cubic. Uh was mentioned in the release notes. Okay. It it, it, it it that's fine. If it's 14.1 and it's the version where it was changed to the default, that means all of Richard Scheffenegger's cubic fixes are in the tree. Because he would have been the one to flip it. Okay. So should the CWND go up or down? And he went. Well, I'm actually. Up quite it should. A bit. Did your bandwidth change at all? Or did no. You, you just got it, nine. It went up slightly. It went from nine point two to nine point three, which means it's a margin of error. It's not. Yeah. Yeah, but the fact that the congestion window jumped from one point six to four point two megabytes. Um is and that's not megabytes per second that's just megabytes yeah um, megabits no it's megabytes yeah but small b and then minutes no it's big b 5.42 capital m capital b yes. y t e s <laughs> yeah. the, so I'm just really surprised it jumped that much. I mean, that's more than a doubling of the size of the congestion window. A short burst may do it, and if there's no reason to scale it back. You turned ECN on, right? Yeah, ECN's to one, and um, we, we set the max uh, buffer to eight meg and the send and receive buffers to eight meg. Yeah, and we're and see we were, you're now, way below what the max is, which is is seven eighths of eight, and the one point six you were hitting the seven eighths of two megabytes, so you were hitting a limit, right? And that limit's now been removed. Can you try again the SSH replication now? Yeah, the Has that anything changed? Yeah, I'm doing that at the moment. To make sure I got this number right. Two, one, two, four, one, two, four. Yeah. Yeah, one point eight three five oh. Yeah. Yeah, this is going to be a while to be able to tell you because I've got one data set that's madly fragmented that I need to get across first. So, um, yeah, I won't have an answer for this call. It keep, keeps bombing out. I've had to keep manually doing it. But looking at looking at it, um, just eyeballing it, I'm getting I'm getting better than what I was seeing yesterday, even with that fragmented data set. Um, just because what's your can you can you, you just run a net stat on your interface once per second and get a rough estimate of what it's transmitting at? Yeah. Net stat dash capital I interface name space one. It's capital I. No, thank you. And there are better uh -huh. tools to get that information if you have them installed. What would you recommend? Uh, IF top or um, what's the other one? 
So that's that Hapl I, lag zero. What's the, is there anything else? Yeah, space one to, to update it for a second. I'm seeing 120,000 packets per second. Okay, how many bytes per second? Um, two, 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 200, no, two, two gig. Two gigabytes. Two gig isn't gigabytes. Gig, yeah, because the output's in bytes. So you're getting 16 gigabits now. No, that can't be right. Yeah, I can't. Why can't it be? You said you had, you had 20 gig I thought this was right? a multi 10 gig lag. Oh, uh, no, hang on. No, it's it's it should not exceed the that. bandwidth of a single link. No, it's it's floor. 200 megabyte, 200, 20587140 So, it's, sorry, it's 200. Two hundred megabytes per second, which is two gigabits per second. Right about. Well, no, it's one point six. That, don't don't forget, I just said that, that I'm, the first data set I'm trying to move that keeps balking all the time is highly You're, fragmented. The machine sort of went there wasn't yes. pruning snapshots, and it's hit hit the it's run out of space when it's been replicating. So I've got. Fragmented data sets everywhere. Okay, and it, yeah, it's it's just doing a shitload of seeks to get. Yeah, exactly. Once I get this clean, I've got one machine cleaned up. Or maybe I kick that one off. That'll tell me. Oh no, because this one's going to be consuming all the IO. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> At least you could run something like G start dash p. To find out how tortured your disks are. I think because we saw your hyperf congestion window size increase, we've definitely not hurt you, and it, it may be a little bit faster, but there may be other things at play. I think you said you were pegging a CPU. Yeah, I've got um, all the disks are basically running at 99%. Yeah. Hmm. So you're right now your IO limited. Yeah. Can't help you there. <laughs> no. You can tune the TCP stack all day. It won't make them disk drives any faster. Mm -hmm. No, I know. Um the drives are gonna be replaced too. It's like the I just started looking at some of the metrics in the um uh, smart mon tools and uh yeah, I think they've They've had enough time since 2017 to be in production. They got 30,000 hours on them yet? Oh, yeah, they're way more than that. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I have a bunch of cost disks, uh, which once upon a time hit for 60,000 hours. Yeah, that's... Don't do that. You you will find the other half of the um, bathtub curve if you do. Yeah. Yeah, they're RAID Z2. What have I got? Gigabytes processed. Read is 39 terabytes. Petabyte, three petabytes. That looks like. The most cursed yeah. disk failure I had was with 2.5 inch. Um... W uh, D red drives because instead of finally dying, they just spiked and had a read latency of north of uh, 400 milliseconds, but never reported failures. They just kept retrying until they eventually succeeded. Yeah, I've got a read. I've got a read delay of 54 reporting in the error log. <laughs> No, no, uh, not even the smart error counters were counting up because it was hiding the retries, but it had like two IOPs left. <laughs> so Alrighty. the bad thing was two disks in a 24 disk pairwise mirrored pool had this problem. So uh, basically, 
they took two rides and then went to uh, sleep and came back the next day, basically. Yeah. Oh, wow, great. So what happened is that things suddenly, reads weren't too bad because it's a rock stealing queue in the scheduler. So, but rights uh, blocked. So things like suddenly big file uploads and next cloud timed out. Yeah, no, the, the guys are dumping stuff to these machines. Like they're dumping a terabyte of SQL backups the night to these machines that um, the, the drives have got an accumulated power on time of 56,155 hours. If you're There's dealing no with out. SQL backups, you may want to look into content-defined de chunking-based tools like Rastic because they will find the patterns where the SQL basically changes and then you can GDOP even SQL dumps effectively. Uh, we, I've got other issues with them trying to do the dumps. They're not doing the dumps correctly. They're they're deleting the file before putting the, the, the change data. If they'd actually just dump the change data, ZFS would handle it all. Only um, if they're not overwriting the file. No, they're not. They're deleting it and then recreating it again. Yeah, so... It's something I've been trying to build around the heads for with them for ages, but just have no luck with trying to get them to understand what my yeah. expectations are. So <laughs> did, you we, may... did we reduce the... I said you could have way more snapshots if you just did it this way. Yep. Or if you use... Maybe that would be a good use case for copy file range to reassemble the big identical snippets if you can find them <laughs> prior to application. What's the experience with wearing out all NVMe ZFS pools? So I'd say I've seen them kick into read-only mode, which is usually helpful, but it was a slog device, which is really not helpful because it sits there trying to uh, write uh, again, a, a few again, bytes for eternity. Yeah, again, the key point was an all NVMe pool. So there is oh, no cool. slog or, or cache or zill or any of that. The whole pool will be on NVMe. I haven't worn out any yet. I don't I'm want the first device get kicked out. No, go ahead, Red. Yeah, I, I'm asking about this because that's the planned proposal for our next upgrade, and it's already evidently been ordered at five eight terabyte NVMe drives. And I went and looked and did some calculations against our current pool, and went, that's not enough space. <laughs> somebody, somebody blew it when they looked at the output of ZFS. Oh. Um, ZFS list dash T all. And I said, well, first off, just do a Z pool list and get an idea. I mean, we've got 55 terabytes consumed right now. And you're going to try and put it on five times eight, 40 terabytes of RAID Z, which is only going to yield you about 20 something terabytes. Wait, using. so they didn't even account for parity? No, they accounted for parity. They looked at the wrong data to know how much we were actually in, in using in storage. And have they asked you about the growth rate and the expected lifetime of the pool? <laughs> because you can't just add two more SSDs to a big red Z-based pool. <laughs> what do you mean you can't just add two? Oh, to grow it? Yep. Yeah. So you can't just add individual SSDs because big fast NVMe SSDs are so expensive. You still have to grow it in at least uh, VDEF batches of one RAID Z group. Uh, there is RAID Z expansion, no? Uh, yes and no. There is, but you're not getting the new increased parity ratio for old data. Okay. So let's say you have eight disks and double parity, so you have six, eight usable storage, if you then grow to nine disks, you still have the sixth eighth ratio for your old writes until you overwrite everything. Yeah, it's, it's not, a, not a concern for us. The, the, there is, there is, the plan is, is not to ever have to grow this pool. Hmm. But yeah, the I don't like reason why you have to probably that, double the pool size. Well, the problem was is that there was a horrifically 
major error and they were estimating that we were currently using 10.2 terabytes in our current pool and we're actually using 55 terabytes in our current Great. pool. Ah. <laughs> Do you even have enough base to fix that? Huh? Do you have enough physical uh, base for that many drives? Yeah, we can go to we can go to um 12 drives so we can we can do 96 terabytes. Raw. But I my my bigger concern is 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 there any wear out experience in running just purely a RAID Z with with eight spindles, RAID Z2, eight NVMe drives? What's the wear out rate? How often do I have to replace one of them? I mean, it, it can rebuild itself, so, but I just, I want to know. Depends on your uh, drive. They should have a daily terabyte rating or terabyte rating. total terabyte yeah. or petabyte. Yeah, or we're buying rating. high end. High reliable drives, but I have no data to base it on. So, do you? What's the data sheet should say something like one di drive right per day, one point five, maybe on the really expensive ones, three drive right. But I don't day. have any historical data on how much we're writing to the pool on wow. a daily, weekly, monthly basis. I have you no should data. be able to, You should you should be able to get that over a month though. Yeah, get the start looking at the counters of your existing disks. Yeah, I can actually dump. I can dump the smart data of the existing pools. We have a five. Start drum. recording those. Huh? Dump those in some kind of uh, time yeah, series yeah. database and find out how much you write. Or, as a bad guesstimate, the daily snapshots uh, or something like that, and then some fudge factor on top of that. And there's literally the written property that you could keep track of. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was yep. I was thinking was the exactly that's what I would recommend as well. Wear out. But if you have a faster pool, potentially you're also finding out that there will be more rights to it because you can serve them. Um, I don't think so, we're band I don't think we're bandwidth limited by our current pool. It's I've actually it's run just a that. Resources tend to be used up if they're available, and IOPS is just one of those. If you make the system faster, some developer will find that they can skip uh, thinking hard. <laughs> yep. Anyway, I, I, I guess I could I could plot or, or start collecting um, Zpool IO stat data for the next. I think I've got till July something before this upgrade is going to happen. I don't have very long. And at even, least even if you've got like half a month of data, would be enough to make an educated guess. Yeah, yeah, but I got the orders for the hardware has already been placed. <laughs> don't look at us. <laughs> Well, you don't look at me. I, I, didn't even, well. I didn't even find out that this was going on until yesterday. So you're going to tier your storage. You have got the all flash. You've got some spinning disks and have a nice day. Yeah, that's what, when I first heard what they were planning to do, I, I, I went like, well, that's not enough space, first off. And second off, I don't know that you should just go throw this all on an NVMe. I, I not. But, I, yeah. I mean, Anything I was, else? I, yep. was, I was wanting NVMe for meta, metadata. Oh, and, right. So that the metadata stuff could go really fast, but I wouldn't. I, there's no. I don't see the reason to put the whole pool on NVMe because the, the, the it just doesn't need that kind of bandwidth or IOPS. It's just not. It's a, it's a continuous integration test platform. It's this the central server that runs a, a bunch of CI jobs that far, it get, all get farmed out to to um, KVM servers. So all, all, it's running bamboo, and it just farms a bunch of jobs out to other machines and then records all the artifacts. Well, there will be a few shoulders to cry on in exactly one week. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I'm, we're good. I, I'm really interested to hear what J, if Jason's seeing any uptake in that. What was two gig or 200 megabytes a second? Yeah, I'll have to. I'll have to. I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, I, right. So I saw. I saw three hundred and fifty yesterday megabytes per second. So I'll see if we get any more than that. But I think. I think we're going to start hitting 
um, SSH limit and and or IO limits of the spinning rust. So, and you're running SSH unencrypted? No, because so you can't run SSH unencrypted. Well, and replace it with net netcat. Yeah, you mentioned it's dark fiber, not a not a concern. Yeah, yeah. Don't use SSH. Use netcat. Yeah, I need to. Is I need to. Want... I need to work out how to shoehorn netcat into Syncoid. Oh. If you want uh, to uh, find out how fast IPsec transport mode could be, just use it to protect your iPerf and then run iPerf again. But it's annoying to set up with strong swarm. But once you have it working, it's reliable. No, it's on OpenBSD. It's not hard to set it up on FreeBSD. There's a certain interface that's missing that I'm going to be presenting on a Fiero BSD con. So which one? We can't tell. Can't tell. <laughs> which it, well, well, he can tell which interface is missing without telling us the solution. No. Come to my talk. Which if, I, if, if my talk gets selected, then come to my talk. And if it doesn't get selected, I'll talk about it in my tutorial. There you go. Okay. The call for participation closes in a few days. So if you're interested, yeah. go ahead. I actually have a PhD student from St. Andrews who's submitting. There for, you go. For ILNP. So I would love to see a way to plug a KTLS TCP socket into ZFS replication. Just I have sent, something. I sent that would be you, nice. I sent you a link to my paper that it's not a KTLS socket, but it's a user land socket shoved to the kernel. You take that and add the KTLS glue to it and you've got it but it was never really uh upstreamed right correct it was but it's, it's yeah. trivial it's a 15 line patch oh that's um enticing a 15 line <laughs> patch uh, that's uh yeah something please try again <laughs> to upstream that if it's that small Because, yeah, passing a already authenticated file. Is, and we already should have this stuff for uh, no, so NFS, Santi, right? Santi just pointed a pull request to... to um, Sinoid, I think. Sinoid, it looks like I've got to look at it. Did this get, did this get committed? No. Uh, yeah, I got here uh, from a request, and it was the request was closed because they merged it in uh, two point two something. Right. Yeah. What was? I'm gonna give that a whirl. Say again. Sorry. I'll give that a whirl. Cool. What's he doing? Yeah, we don't know how much of this is a uh, assuming spherical cows. Well, well, this is this looks like my net cat. Or my my sin socket. So cat command. Oh yeah, he's using so cat socket cat, which yeah, it allows you to parameterize your socket, but it's still user space to kind of copy and. It's back. still it, yeah, it's still this is still using a, a user space thing. So you you take this and wrap it on top of Rod sin socket, and you probably have Sonoid doing. Um, no trip to user land data transfers. Yeah, you still need a user space daemon to handle uh, TLS rekeying because with uh, ZFS, it's quite likely that you're reaching data limits where you really should rekey uh, your uh, TLS connection instead of just starting with one session key and then keeping going until you've sent a petabyte or so. I can't see that option in the in the options for the Syncoid. Because uh, Rob's uh, talk was never uh, no no no. Screen. This is he's talking about the the pull five five thirteen to Sinoid. Oh. Or were you talking about Sin Socket? No, I'm talking about Syncoid. Yeah. Michael? Yeah. You're going to have to schedule this call more often. It's, uh -huh. not, it's taking two hours to get through it. 
Gareth, I think because well, I joined focused. in today. I usually, it, it's, it's a bit hard for me at the moment because we have 10 UTC. So all the, all the calls I can't sort of hit. Well, that's okay. Based on the message that uh, got sent out, we just started the call an hour early. What? Oh, no, it wasn't. It was my calculation for UTC. No, I checked it. I, have I think it I wrong? checked it. Is it. Oh, yeah, 1 o'clock. Yeah, you started, at, you started at 12 o'clock UTC. Oh, really? Hmm. Definitely not 12 o'clock UTC. Mm. Not now. It it's, should be 8 p.m. UTC. Well, eight was eight was what he sent. I thought it was. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Like What's... and subscribe. What else you got? So it's twenty one forty UTC right now. Yes, I was going to call it. Anything else? Happy Filipino Independence Day, according Yay! to <laughs> except in <laughs> Australia. Well, actually, I don't know what day it falls on. No, we, we, we're 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 on the, we're in the in the uh, in the future. We're, uh, we're yeah, but presumably the, the Philippines is, is presumably it's uh, there as well, right? I wonder if June tenth yeah. is actually the day. Anyway, sorry. The <laughs> yeah, Philippines is pretty close to our our time. Which small island was it that switched to the other side of the dateline? Uh, where there only a few weeks of water. Oh, that's brilliant! <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Oh, uh, uh, I love time zone stuff. Fun they went back, what I think. Um, I remember when uh, when speak going back to ZFS, uh, the product I uh, was helping to support ten years ago. Um, we had an interesting time when uh, Arizona decided to abolish daylight savings time, oh, and so all of our MSP and bar customers that were there were wondering what the hell was going on with their backups. Hmm. Why, why are you taking so them an hour ahead of time? They didn't catch up that people were blamed if their software was doing the right thing because almost everyone was doing it wrong. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Like and subscribe. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Okay.